education is so much more than a job. It's a calling. As educators, we are leaders. We are given a profound trust, and that trust comes with responsibility. All students deserve a high-quality education, whether they are native or newcomer, black, Latino, Asian, or white. They deserve safe and welcoming public schools. Every student deserves the support they need to thrive. This is the promise of democracy, and we must take responsibility to learn, grow, and act to make sure we are equipped with the skills to make the promise a reality. Welcome back for day two of the 2021 NEA Virtual Leadership Summit. Welcome everyone to day two of the virtual 2021 NEA National Leadership Summit. I hope yesterday's opening and events gave you plenty to think about. If you attended the yoga session this morning, I hope you received a wonderful body and mind experience. As a reminder to President Pringle's remarks yesterday, we're going to begin our day with an ask. Yesterday, you should have received an email from the Leadership Summit asking you to join us in the fight to hashtag cancel the tests. As you know, the US Department of Education, Big Ed as we call it, recently announced that it would not approve statewide testing waivers this year. Instead, they released guidance on flexibilities for state accountability systems that totally ignores the realities on the ground. This is not good enough for our students and schools. We should not be conducting standardized testing in a pandemic. We should be measuring what matters and directing resources to address the inequities that have been exacerbated by this pandemic. So we need to take action to let the Department of Education know that they need to make this right. Take out your phone right now or whatever device you use to email and please email the Department of Education at the address on the screen. Be sure to include the subject line on this slide that you're viewing now. Let the Department of Education know how important it is that states focus their efforts on rebuilding school communities and ensuring precious learning time is not sacrificed to standardized testing. <sighs> okay. I have to settle myself down now. I get so infuriated anytime I hear about testing period, but testing during, during a pandemic is absurd. We're in a pandemic, people. We're in a pandemic. Okay, okay, okay. I am settling myself down. I'm settling myself down. Back to the summit. Thank you. Thank you for making those contacts. Becky led an awesome kickoff yesterday. We have more great things planned for you today. As I listened to Becky talk about the leadership competencies yesterday, especially the new social and emotional intelligence competency, I put myself in the place of our students. I imagined all that they have been through this year. I imagine being an elementary school student who just discovered what it feels like to have a best friend, a favorite bus driver, or love for a teacher. I thought about the joy I'd feel seeing that person every day, how they would gradually become a very important part of my social, mental, and emotional health and well being. Then I imagined if my school closed because of COVID on a 
extremely short notice and maybe without any warning to me. And only being able to see some of those people through a computer sitting on the desk in my bedroom or on my family's dining table or on the kitchen counter or maybe even on my mom's phone. After that, I imagined being a child without any of those things. No computer, no connectivity, maybe even no place to call home. I imagined being a student who had to get used to eating less because when my school was open, it helped to keep me fed. I thought about how it must feel to be a student of any age has to shoulder the worry of whether someone in my family might become ill. I asked myself what I would do and how I would feel if I were an LGBTQ plus student living in a family who refused to honor who I was and maybe thought that it made it okay to mistreat me. I imagined being a differently abled student, someone who could no longer experience the one-to-one -one interaction that was once the key to helping me learn. Finally, I asked myself how I would feel after enduring just one of those scenarios for an entire year. As educators who stand on the front lines and work valiantly to help students overcome the barriers to learning that the pandemic revealed and worsened, we know this, that even as we celebrate the prioritization of educators for vaccines, even as we applaud President Biden's signing of the American Rescue Plan and the additional educational funding it creates to keep schools safe, even as our country takes these very important steps toward some sort of new normal, we know that our students won't just be bringing new backpacks into the school building. They'll bring along with them lingering trauma. Today and tomorrow, we will delve more deeply into the seven competencies you'll have many opportunities to consider ways you can integrate them into your work and into your leadership journey once this summit is over. And as you're doing that, I ask that you do our students a personal favor. Give some really close attention to the new competency of social and emotional intelligence. Consider how you can care for yourself effectively so that you can really and truly care for our students in this moment when they need us the most. I also ask you to consider how you can weave that seventh competency in all of the other competencies to increase your effectiveness as a leader. You know, I am a music teacher as a student, I played the bassoon. My musical background sometimes causes me to view our competencies in such a way in which I look at the compassion and the composition of an orchestra. This helps me when I think about that an orchestra is in separate sections. We have the strings, the woodwinds, the brass, and the percussion. Each of the sections sound just fine on their own, but when you put them all together, wow, that's when the real magic begins. Our competencies are like that. You can just take one and make it your own. Our hope is that you would braid them together and figure out how they can show up together in every aspect of your work, that you will think about what you need to do to write the music of leadership, of a leadership journey that will ring true to your ears 
into your heart? How will you create a path to greater effectiveness as a leader so that you are equipped to support our union in its highest goal, ensuring that every student has the opportunity to attend a public school that has the resources that can help them to do their best. Today, we will continue to explore the competencies. We will hear about young people who are leading alongside us and standing with us to demand that every aspect of public education is viewed through an equity lens. We will move in today's program in much the same way that you moved yesterday's offerings with Becky. We will start by setting an intention that claims the person we want to be or the result we hope to manifest as if it were already true. I'll guide you into that in just a moment, but first, I'll tell you a brief story about how I arrived at an intention for myself. For a long time, far longer than I care to admit, I would start my day by checking my email as soon as my eyes open. As soon as I woke up in the morning, I'd roll to the side of the bed and check my email. Well, what I ultimately realized was that if I saw something I didn't care for, my day would get off to a very rough start. Depending on the email, it would make it hard for me to get mentally or emotionally back on track. Now, I start my days with a simple spiritual practice. I lengthen or shorten it depending on how much time I have. And then I meet the day. As time went on, I noticed that my practice was helping me to stay balanced and grounded for the day. And for most of the day, I was very calm. No matter what emails arrived, no matter what anyone said, I just stayed calm. Over time, I have embraced that feeling as my personal intention as a leader, really as a human moving through this ever-changing world. I am calm. I claim that state of being for myself every morning. I reclaim it for myself periodically throughout the day. It has made such a difference in how I move through the day and in how I interact with others. And in the results, I see my own journey as a leader. So I'm going to ask you to claim an intention for yourself. It can be the same thing you claimed yesterday, or it can be something entirely different. Take a moment to become still and just think about what you need in order to craft for yourself a solid leadership journey. For me, it was being and staying calm, no matter what came my way. For you, it might mean being more assertive, or it might mean stepping back and being a better listener. Think about how you need to show up in order to be effective. Then in turn, take that, desire and make it an affirmative sentence in which you claim that state of being for yourself and then carry your intention in your heart and in your mind as you experience this second summit day. Thank you for that. My name is Natalia Coase and I am joining the NEA Summit on behalf of Voces de la Frontera. Voces de la Frontera is a nonprofit organization that fights for change by taking action. 
I have been a member of Voices for almost a year now. I am a part of the YES group, which is Youth Empowered in the Struggle. It is aimed at BIPOC youth who want to make change and who face struggles firsthand. I am 15 years old. Because of my age, I thought I couldn't have an impact or make a difference, but I have since learned that that is far from the truth. NEA is a partner with Voices. Through our partnership, especially during the 2020 election cycle, we were able to turn Wisconsin blue. Though many of our youth organizers are not old enough to go, on election day, we reached 10,000 doors. YES has organized a black and brown solidarity protest to show that we are in support of black lives and much more. Voices and YES are still taking action locally each day. It has been a pleasure to work with my peers to create change and fight for what is right. Knowing that a group of young people can do so much and have a lasting impact is an amazing community to be a part of. As you focus on your own leadership development, I implore you to remember the youth voices. It encourages us when adults invite us and involve us. At Voices, we learn to use our voice to make change, to take action, and fight for what we believe is right. Yes, some may shy away from the action because they are scared. As commonly said, be the change you want to see, be brave, and be bold. We are willing to step out and take the risk of leadership. It helps when we see our peers taking action and advocating for change. It is both inspiring and eye-opening. These are the kinds of experiences I've had working with bosses, and these are the experiences you will have during this summit and long after the training ends. And when the summit is over, I hope you remember that young people are watching. We need your leadership and we want to lead alongside you to create the movement for a better world for all of us. Have a great summit. Thank you. I want to thank Natalie Acosta for those incredible remarks. Natalie is from Wisconsin and is a member of Youth Empowered in the Struggle, or YES. YES is the youth arm of Voices de la Frontera. Voices is a membership-based community organization led by low-wage workers, immigrants, and youth whose mission it is to protect and expand civil rights and workers' rights through leadership development, community organizing, and empowerment. Together, Yes and Voices de la Frontera strive to create a world where all people live free of poverty and discrimination, have access to safe, dignified work, a quality education, and health care, one in which immigrants can cross borders with dignity and human rights are respected where government is truly of the people and all families thrive. Voices is a partner organization and works closely with NEA's Community Advocacy and Partnership Engagement Department. <laughs> Again, I want to thank Natalie from Youth Empowered in Our Struggle for those incredible remarks. And now, I have the great pleasure of introducing today's keynote speaker, Dr. Andre Perry. You know, I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Perry a few weeks ago, and he said something very powerful that has remained with me ever since. Since our conversation, I've taken the opportunity to quote his words to a variety of audiences. He told me that one of the things that he tells people to remember is that kids don't live in schools. They live in communities. What he meant is that instead of looking narrowly through a lens that asks simply how public schools can be strengthened, apertures must widen to take in the community that surrounds the school. Then the question becomes, what are the macro forces that impact the community that surrounds the school? The real work, Dr. Perry said, is at the community level. I loved hearing that from him. His words confirmed that the NEA's ongoing work to create racial and social justice 
and our more recent efforts to shine a bright spotlight on the inequities COVID revealed and worsened are right on track. Because the fact of the matter is that those inequities are systemic community problems that make themselves known in our schools. They are not student problems or parent problems or educator problems. They are challenges that are found far too frequently in our black, brown and indigenous communities and in our communities that have been marginalized for, gener for generations. <sighs> Dr. Perry is a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. His research focuses on race and, stru and structural inequality, education and economic inclusion. Before joining Brookings, <coughs> excuse me, he was founding Dean Professor and award-winning journalist in education. In 2015, he served the K-12 Transition Committee of Louisiana Governor-elect John Bell Edwards and he was co-chair of the education transition team for New Orleans Mary Lack Mitch Lendro. He is also the creator of several academic writings and he is often featured in television, print and digital media. We are so fortunate to be able to hear some words of wisdom from our friend, fellow educator and co-conspirator in the fight for educational justice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andre Perry. Dr. Perry. Hey, thank you, Princess, for that presentation of those warm words. And um, you you, you forget, uh, did not mention that um, President uh, Becky Pringle was one of my first teachers. Um, she was trained in the Wilkinsburg School District and where I went to school. Um, and, it, and I'll mention a lot about where I grew up in my presentation worthy of investment, restoring the value to black community. So let's let's get right into it um, and, and, and start looking at this presentation, if you will. So I'll, I'll allow for a little time. There we go. So um, if you could advance this slide for me and I will um, ask, um, um, you'll hear that repeatedly throughout the, the presentation. Uh, so I don't want to disturb you, but that's how we're going to advance the slides. A lot of about what I'm about to say, you can find in my, my book, Know Your Price, or oh, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities, available wherever fine books are sold. Next slide, please. At the Brookings Institution, I've I study uh, black majority cities and you can see and neighborhoods and where you can you can see on this map there are several there are more than 1200 black majority cities where the share of the black population is greater than 50%. Um, obviously there are m many more black neighborhoods but they can't fit on the map. If you can click the next slide. Um, I in particular I study the assets in them. Um, and if you could and w many of the assets um, that I talk about, including includes housing. This is where I grew up. This is um, 1320 Hill Avenue, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, Wilkinsburg is a small municipal, black majority black municipality surrounded by Pittsburgh on three sides. Um, this is my home. As you may can tell that the house is boarded up. It's abandoned. The roof is bowed. Um, but the home is worth so much more to me. If you can um, click the next slide, please. Um, and the reason why the this the home is worth so much more to me is if you can see that woman in the upper right hand corner. Her name is Elsie Boyd. I call her mom. As, as the story was told to me. Um, mom made a deal with my maternal grandmother that she would take me in because at the time um, in the 70s, uh, U.S. Steel was pulling out. Um, unemployment was at 20 percent. And if you know anything about labor um, 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 statistics, you know that when um, if that that uh, general unemployment rate is 20 percent is probably significantly higher for black people. So a lot of folks were suffering. Um, um, my, my mother at the time was poor 
Um, she had my older brother when she was 15, had me when she was 17. She was probably abused. So my um, um, Elsie Boyd mom took me in and, and I stayed till I graduated from high school. But as you can see, she took in other kids for varying durations. Some would stay a few months. Some like me would stay till they graduated from high school. Um, if you can click on the next slide, and, and she took in many kids. Um, this um, young man, this is my father, um, Floyd Criswell. Um, the, one of the reasons why mom had to take me in is because my father was a heroin addict. He was in and out of prison um, in and around Detroit where he was born. He, he went back and forth between Detroit and Pittsburgh, but eventually he was imprisoned in Detroit where someone took his life. He was stabbed in the heart a day before his 27th birthday. Um, but he probably, again, he probably abused my um, mother. Um, and he, and, and what, what I was told growing up, he died breaking up a fight in prison. But I generally didn't believe that. Um, but when I started researching my book, I got to to learn about how he lived. If you could get to the next slide, please move on. You know, and, and one of the things I, I studied is I looked at where he lived and not to give a, a large history lesson, but he lived in areas that were redlined where um, as many of you know, during the, um, um, after the great depression, FDR, um, um, introduced his the New Deal, and part of that was to give low interest housing loans to air, to families so that they could start new communities. Um, but if though you lived in a community that was redlined, um, you did not receive those kind of benefits because they were considered too hazardous to lend out a loan. Um, many of those places were black majority areas. Um, he also, and my mom, uh, my father and my mom lived in areas that a highway construction barreled through their communities. There was urban renewal where, um, in, in the case in Pittsburgh, they destroyed or uh, bulldozed the um, Hill District um, homes where black people live um, to build the civic arena. Um, there was also, they lived in areas that where there was a lot of predatory lending and obviously restrictive housing covenants. If you can forward the next slide, please. And, you know, and, and so I started looking in, in today's context, what that meant. Now on this slide, if you can pick it up on the X axis, on that bottom axis, that's the percentage of black people in a zip code. On the Y axis is indicated in the home, uh, um, on the, um, dollar amounts on the top of the bars, those are the prices in um, of the average price of homes in those neighborhoods. And you can see as the um, share of the black population goes up, the home prices go down. So homes in black neighbor uh, in neighborhoods where the share of the black population is less than a percent, um, those homes on average are priced about $340,000. In places where um, the share of the black population is half of uh, 50 percent or more there those prices are half as much a lot of people will say that's because of education that's because of crime but those are things you can control for in a study and that's what we did so next slide please so we so next yes next slide next slide so we looked at the absolute price difference and we controlled for st uh, structural characteristics. So the homes with the same number of rooms, same size, square footage, but we also controlled for neighborhood amenities. Um, so education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics. So we could get an apples to apples comparison between homes in black neighborhoods and homes in white neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And what we found pretty much astound that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Again, these are equivalent homes um, between black and white neighborhoods. Next slide. Accumul cumulatively, that's about 156 billion in lost equity, 156 billion. And we know that um, how homes are priced 
um, affects how schools are funded. So, um, next slide, please. And you can see from this um, map that um, wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where devaluation is occurring all across the, the country. Wherever you see a green circle, that is where homes in black neighborhoods are actually priced higher um, than their white counterparts. Next slide. Um, just to give an example, uh, Detroit um, homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 30, about 37 percent, about 28,000 per home. Next slide. And you can see all across the country, this is occurring. Lynchburg, Virginia, 81% difference, 81% difference. So if you helicoptered a home in a black neighborhood and put it in a white neighborhood of, of similar neighborhood, it would increase in value by 81%. 65% difference in Rochester, New York, 47% in Jacksonville. Um, but again, there are places where homes in, in black neighborhoods are priced more. Uh, Nashville, for instance, plus 10 percent. Wichita Falls, plus 16. Boston, um, plus 23. But I, I always remind you that uh, remind folks that Boston is no less racist than Lynchburg, but the home prices are higher. Next slide, please. And I'm going to just put this 156 billion in perspective. Um, most people, again, uh, educators know that how we fund education is a result of how we um, price home. But I'm just going to put this 156 billion in perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide. 156 billion dollars would have financed more than four million black-owned businesses based on the average amount black people use to start up their firms. It would have paid for more than 8 million four-year degrees based on the average amount of a four-year public education. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over. Um, it would have covered all of Hurricane Katrina damage um, nearly, and it has doubled the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. The reason why I put that last bullet up there is clearly my father um, went to prison because he had a heroin addiction. But if he lived in a neighborhood in which home prices were market rate or the white rate, he would have had better um, or more finance schools. He would have had better infrastructure. He probably wouldn't have gone to prison for his drug addiction. He probably would have gone to a drug rehab center. He would have been more likely to start a business, go to college. He, his life would have been different. So um, clearly I'm, um, I, 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 I hold him accountable for his behaviors. But his life would have been different if he lived anywhere else. That's why I say that um, that housing devaluation was an accomplice in his death. Next slide. And it's also um, the one of the reasons why I say there's there's, there, there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. Too often, when things go wrong in schools, when things go wrong in neighborhoods. We blame black people, we blame black teachers, we blame black school boards, instead of looking at the policies that influence those conditions that lead to results. Next slide. I also say this all the time, as was mentioned, kids don't live in schools, they live in communities. How often have we heard this saying, that if we could only fix the schools, everything will be all right? That is simply not true. Schools, as, 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 as important as schools are, they are just part of a collection of systems that ultimately impact people's lives. So if we don't address housing discrimination, if we don't address transportation, if we don't address employment, schools will always suffer. And so that I'm going to go to the next, um, um, go to the next slide. I'm going to show how this housing devalue, um, um, how people view devaluation um, it, in the context uh, um, or view discrimination in the context of housing. Here you're about to hear an exchange between Al, Representative Al Green of Texas and myself and members of the appraiser, appraisal industry. Um, Al Green um, asked us a basic question. Do, uh, do we believe there's discrimination in the housing market? Take a look at this. Do you believe that 
invidious discrimination, invidious is harmful, invidious discrimination plays a role in the devaluation of property in neighborhoods that are predominated with minorities, but more specifically, black people. If you do believe this, raise your hand. I want my staff who, who are recording this to be sure to get this picture. Would you raise your hand again, please? Only one person believes that invidious discrimination plays a role. So let me ask again for fear that you didn't understand. If you think black people are being discriminated when their property is being appraised, would you kindly raise your hand? One person on the panel. If you think that, for fear that I'm not communicating well, if you think that black people are not being discriminated against when their property is being appraised, if you think they're not being discriminated against, kindly raise your hand. Okay, hands now, we're getting some consternation, I see. You know, that's an incredible exchange in this regard and, and, and why it's important. If we continue to deny that there's discrimination in things like housing, transportation, criminal justice, schools will hurt as a result. And so I'm gonna just show you one other area that emphasizes this point. Next slide, I did a um, similar study on business. Next slide, please. Now, um, a lot of people will say, um, well, um, businesses aren't as good in black neighborhoods because of, of quality, because of service. So I wanted to explore that issue as well. So we know that black people represent about 14% of the population, but only 2% of the employer businesses in the United States, meaning businesses with more than one employee. Um, only 1% of black businesses receive a loan in their founding year compared to 7% of white entrepreneurs. Remember, both those numbers are re relatively low because most people start their businesses using the equity in their home. And so um, obviously the 1% is, is connected to the housing discrimination I pointed to earlier. Black business, uh, black business owners are denied bank loans more than twice as often as their white peers. Next slide, please. And when we do get loans, we pay higher interest rates. About half of black businesses survived the Great Recession compared to 60% of white owned firms and 95 of black business owner, of black businesses did not receive the PPP loan um, a subsidy of the CARES Act because most black businesses are sole, proprietors, per, sole proprietorships, which were, weren't included in that package. Next slide, please. Now, a lot of people, again, when they say um, businesses um, don't get investment, it's because of quality. Next, next slide. So I wanted to examine that very issue. Oh, go back. I'm sorry about that. There's a delay. So we looked at business revenue um, of businesses all across the country, but we scraped all the Yelp data to get a, a sense of quality from all the businesses in the United States. But again, we control for spending power education so we could get an apples to apples comparison of between businesses in black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. Next slide. And what we found pretty much astounds that um, businesses and um, um, black, brown, and Asian businesses actually score higher than Yelp, than their white counterparts. Um, when you control for the business type, they're even, but in the aggregate, they score higher than, than their white business owner counterparts. Next slide. But they get less stars as the neighborhood gets blacker. Um, and I'll explain that. Next slide, please. See that magenta line? That, those are black, brown, and Asian businesses. And see the gray line? That's white businesses. Again, black, brown, and Asian businesses consistently score higher in Yelp. But as the neighborhood gets um, blacker, as you can see on that 
x-axis that's the concentration of black people in a neighborhood as the neighborhood gets blacker the the scores go down and eventually the revenue goes down um so all businesses um get less stars as the neighborhood gets blacker uh, next slide please and this results in lower revenue growth next slide just go to And this is costing high quality businesses upwards of $4 billion. Next slide, please. Now there's a saying in, in black neighborhoods that you may have heard, it, um, but this is something we used to say all the time and the folks who raised me, they would say our ice is just as cold. And that's a saying that, that suggested that our businesses are just as good. And, and that saying holds up that um, businesses in black neighborhoods are just as good, but they're just not getting the same support because of the people in it. Now, um, but the elders also knew if you don't patronize businesses in black neighborhoods, you distort the market in a way that forces high quality businesses to compete with low quality businesses. And you just get less revenue as a result. Next, next um, line, please. Next slide, please. Now, how how to counter this? Um, you, first, you have to invest in people, meaning direct subsidies to people, to business owners, homeowners. If you invest in place and not people, you will raise property values and the people will essentially be um, forced out because people won't keep pace. So you have to create programs and initiatives and in which capital is directed to people, meaning um, home ownership programs, business ownership programs, and the like. We also have to remove the unnecessary bureaucratic barriers to entry into entrepreneurialism and um, and in home ownership. So what that last uh, set of data showed you that our businesses are just as good. So we don't have to go through these financial literacy programs in order to get a loan or a grant. But we do need to invest in places, meaning um, you have to you have to direct capital towards black neighborhoods because because of the valuation, they had less of it. Um, and then finally, you must divest from racism. We have lots of systems that extract wealth from black communities. So we need to um, remove those barriers and, and insert anti um, racist policies. Um, or replace them with anti-racist policies. Next slide. In closing, I just want to offer up something to um, folks um, in the audience if they want to participate. I partner with the Ashoka organization. We're going to give um, um, this uh, totaling of up to a million dollars of prize money to organizations, firms, people working on housing devaluation. So if you have solutions around creating new types of zoning ordinances, new credit scoring systems, new mortgage products, we want to hear it and we're going to incentivize that work. Um, because we know if we want to improve schools, we're going to have to remove discrimination in housing, in transportation, and in other areas. Next slide, please. Actually, that, that should close us out. You can come to me. The, the, the full screen. But again, a lot of this can be found in my book, Know Your Price, um, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. Make sure you um, get a copy. But again, I've been a longtime educator um, for so long. And so often I just hear this refrain, if we could fix schools, which in so many ways just distracts us from dealing with the conditions in which schools reside, the conditions in which students live. And so if we're going to move forward on any kind of education reform, we need any um, housing reform, we need transportation reform, we need criminal justice changes. Those are the kinds of reforms that will uplift schools in the process. So I just wanna thank everyone for, for having me, um, 
hopefully we can work together on these issues moving forward. But um, again, there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. Kids don't live in schools, they live in communities. And if we can address these structural issues, schools will improve. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that so much, Dr. Perry. That was incredibly awesome. Um, I believe that we are almost at the end of our our time. Um, I wanted to take um, questions. I don't believe we have time for questions, but I am going to sneak one in there um, for Dr. Perry, if you don't mind. So Dr. Perry, being an educator yourself, what is it, what is it that we can do as a union to help make a difference? And everything that you've shared with us, what, what, what do you see as a proactive role that we can take as a union? You know, I really believe that the leadership must work alongside um, um, or do systems work. That's why it's important for um, um, President Pringle to work with the HUD secretary, to work with the transportation secretary, to work with a Department of Energy that so much focus is on schools and it's in, in many ways, it's a, a, a way to um, abdicate the responsibility in dealing with all these other issues. And so I think that, that leadership, um, and again, I believe in schools. I believe in the power of school, don't, don't get me wrong. But if we don't correct these other systems, there's only so much you can do within a school. And too often we're constantly trying to fix kids, fix teachers. That's not, that's not what's broken. It's these systems that, so, that throttle mo economic and social mobility for everyone, including teachers, including students. And so for me, it's about having um, your, your, the leadership really address these structural issues that impact schools and, and, and everyone in them. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that. that and that makes me feel um, good in the sense that we at NEA have begun that, that work. Um, we, and and um, we, are, we are making some inroads into addressing the systems that impact um, the, the lives of our students and um, the lives of the families in which you know, our students are a part of. So thank you for that. Um, do we have, are there any more questions? Are there any more questions? Are they popping up for, for Dr. Perry? I have, I can always ask questions, but I want to give our participants some time for that. If, if there, Dr. Perry, if there, are there any popping up for you? I can always go to another question. Okay, I'll ask another question. Um, so in your book, there's a chapter about the apologies we owe students and teachers. I know that that title resonates with a lot of the folks listening today. Can you expound a little bit on that for us? Yeah. Yeah, you know, for a lot of people who know me, they know me more from education and they know me um, somewhat from my role as a charter school leader in New Orleans. Now, in that space, when I was in New Orleans, um, it, it was a um, very difficult time and across many different sectors. But one of the mistakes that, that everyone in New Orleans made was to blame teachers, was to blame school boards for the educational outcomes in New Orleans. And during that time, that's when I became very disaffected with the charter school movement because literally people were, um, teachers were being fired in mass, um, largely out of blame. Um, and not to get too much into it, but um, the super, state superintendent at the time, in my opinion, withheld recovery money, forcing the school district to, um, to fire the employees. And then when um, they changed the charter laws, it um, expanded the number of charter schools in the area. And when the charter leaders had a chance to hire back people, 
they didn't hire black folks or they they hired a lot more white folks in the process the the black teacher population dropped from 70 percent to to 50 percent which put a, a horrible burden on the black middle class eroded the black middle class and 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 all for not we know that black teachers um add in terms of educational value um a, a students taught by black teacher score um, higher on um, in terms of academic uh, their academic scores have better social outcomes and so this firing of of black teachers and and, and mind you they also expel students in mass so for me it was about saying hey we need to own up and apologize to the thousands of teachers who were fired abused blamed and so i wanted to to put that in my book and 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 take some take a lot of ownership in that because i was in that system and and i've been encouraging people all across the country who were in the charter school movement to do the same is you're not going to uh die if you say i'm sorry i was wrong I mean, it, it, you're, you'll be okay. People will embrace you. And especially if you're doing the good work after. So a lot, but when I was there, that's when I learned, hey, this is not about teachers. I mean, in New Orleans, it was about the discrimination against black people. And just one point, when we were, op when the, the city was opening, they, we literally locked out people from moving back by shuttering all the public housing in the area. Um, black people were jailed and, and shot in the street. And what that discrimination looked like in, in schools was to fire teachers. And so for me, that's when I was like, this is not what reform is about. It, it should be about s s um, addressing the structural barriers that hurt um, all educators, but instead we blamed black yeah. people, black school boards, black teachers, and we need to apologize for that. And so, um, you know, not enough, not enough charter leaders, ed reform leaders have have owned up to the that those um, tragedies. So I wanted mm -hmm. to be the the you know I wanted to say, hey, I am sorry, I apologize, and do the work to yeah. correct and to restore as much as you can. Wow, thank you for that. That is that is very powerful, Dr. Perry. Um, and I have one last question. People think they can text me, you know, but there there was there is a question um, we from um, Tennessee. My friend Tanya Coates really wants to know how can how can we get in um, if someone wants to start getting involved in the community and they haven't done this. What, what what would you suggest? Where 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 would you suggest they begin to take on um, some of the things that you have laid out for us? You know, this is where I think labor has a a, a significant role. Labor in different areas. Um, every once in a while, there's moments where we have to look upon issues in a systemic way, and so I say, reach out to your union leadership. Um, at the state and national level to say, where are these committees um, and these, these now, I'll give you an example. Right now in Alabama, um, Amazon workers are, um, are forming a union there, right? Yeah. Now, this is the moment where um, workers um, and Amazon workers and, and labor um, and teacher unions should link up. Because how uh, um, workers are paid ultimately impacts how much schools receive in funding, um, um, the, the, the lifestyles that um, parents live, they, they are parents. And so these are the moments where there needs to be cross-pollination between movements, um, between education and other labor movements. And that's where I think people can get involved because in, a lot of people just assume that um, housing and employment and transportation is the same across different communities. It is not. And so 
Um, if you don't know, you have to either read about it, write about it, or meet somebody who knows about it. And that's why I say, hey, every once in a while, it's okay to step out of your educator role and talk to somebody in healthcare, talk to somebody in, in um, worker justice issues, talk to somebody in transportation, because then you'll see these connections and make the connections. And then you can learn um, how to create agendas that mm -hmm. change overarching structures that limit us all. And so for me, that's how I've been working to say, hey, you know, stop this, this constant um, meme of saying, if we can only fix the schools. No, schools are part of greater systems. And, but, but that's hard for us to do because we, we know the power of education. We think we can do it all. Right. We cannot. we cannot. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for being with us. I won't ask you the question of, of how was Mrs. Pringle as your teacher, but we'll say that for another time. <laughs> well, that's why, wait, hey, that's why I'm, I'm here and able to articulate and demonstrate the, 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 the work that I do because of great teachers, including uh, the great uh, uh, Dr. Pringle. So put, thank you. Thank you very much. And to all the great teachers out there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. All right. We're going to move to the last part of our um, um, plenary session for today. We have some more winners. Oh, my gosh. NEA Member Benefits is contributing $300 for, for these prizes, $300 per person. Oh my gosh. So I'm not going to read the names. You can see them on the screen. Oh, why not? Why don't I read the names? Carla Griswell from Kentucky, Nicole Ellis from Colorado, Norma Guerrera from Texas, Julie Hindeman from Indiana, and Vicki Jaquette from Louisiana. You'll be getting $300 courtesy of NEA member benefits. Thank you all for an amazing plenary session. I will see you back here at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time.